London and welcome back and I'm pleased to have Tetsu Young for the second part of uh, our uh, conversation about language learning. Great to see you again Tetsu. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me again, Gareth. And if you saw the first interview I did with Tetsu, you'll know that uh, we were going to come back and talk about raising kids bilingually or multilingually, in fact, in Tetsu's case. Bit of background. You'll remember that mm. Tetsu uh, grew up uh, first in Taiwan, uh, speaking um, Mandarin and Japanese, Taiwanese and Hakka, and picked up English as well in kindergarten. And then since being a teenager has lived in Montreal or around about that area in Quebec and therefore also speaks French and has learned Spanish and um, also has learned some German and Italian to a lower level. Uh, that's I got that right. You have amazing uh, memory. <laughs> yep. And so then you, uh, you got married and you've got children. Your wife is Japanese. Uh, so that's Japanese again in the mix, already there, but again in the mix. Yep. And um, how many children do you have then? What are their ages? So I have three children, yep. uh, age five, almost six. Uh, and so my son is five, almost six. My daughter is four. And then my youngest is one, uh, one year and five months. And when the first one was on the way, had you already had discussions about what was going to happen linguistically with your yes. wife? Oh, I, I, absolutely. Absolutely. We've discussed this uh, really throughout, you know, the time we were together uh, and everything's uh, planned out, expected, um, you know, not all planned out, but, but really we knew which direction we wanted to go. And that was multilingual mm -hmm. <laughs> and definitely uh, give them everything that I already have. So uh, the five languages that I speak fluently, the English, French, Japanese, Mandarin, and Spanish, these are the five languages that I, that, uh, I consider myself fluent in. I, now I think that these are the five most useful languages that I have. Uh, and so I want to pass these ones on to my kids. So from day one, um, even before my kids were born, uh, we, uh, we, we started, I was talking to my, my wife's tummy in Mandarin and and, you know, she would talk to her own tummy in Japanese. Uh huh. And so uh, have you followed, uh, continued with that policy then <clears throat> of the, you know, it's the, the one, the one parent, one language philosophy for those two languages. Is that what you've done? That, that is, that is correct. So the OPOL that you were referring to, O-P-O-L. So it's, many people call it the one person, one parent, one language, but we, uh, we refer it to the one person, one language so that we can go beyond two. <laughs> so, uh, but that, that, that is really our, our religion. Uh, everything we do revolves around assigning uh, language uh, to a person. So the kids are the ones that have to switch around uh, depending on who they talk to. So they know when I talk to this person, it's this language. Uh, and it's been their whole life. So, and it's working out very well. So obviously that means to start with of those five languages, Japanese with your wife uh, yes. and um, Mandarin with you, uh, but yes. um, not just those. So that would be the, I no. suppose most people would be in a bilingual situation if, if a partner speaks mm -hmm. a different language. So yes. uh, you could maintain that rule. Um, before yep. we go on to accommodating the other languages, uh, mm. I suppose you're saying that the children then have to switch. What happens yes. if the child uh, answers you in Japanese uh, instead of speaking to you in Mandarin or vice versa with your wife? How would one deal with that? Okay. So first of all, you need to be consistent. So kids can make mistakes and they speak to you, you know, they would speak to me in Japanese by accident. Perhaps when they've not really mastered the language as well, that can happen. Uh, but the most important thing is consistency or say it differently, building a habit. For me, that, that's, that's everything. So you build a habit uh, of you know, making sure that they would speak this language with you. Uh, and if they, if they don't, uh, there are ways around it uh, where you can, as a parent, continue to speak in, in the, the tar target language. Um, and beyond that, I, th there's the carrot and the stick <laughs> that you can employ. Uh, there's 
if they are getting older, you you can definitely I guess talk some sense. So would <laughs> you, know, you pretend let not let them to understand, understand the why? Yes. Would you pretend not to understand a younger child? Uh, uh, for if example? it yes, if they're very young, that's that's what I would do. Yes. So to be honest, in our situation, we've not had to deal with it so much. Uh, maybe yet. Uh, maybe maybe it's coming. I I don't know, but. If if that does come up, that is how we plan on dealing uh, with it. Um, but uh, for us, in our philosophy, what's important is re- is really the young, the very young age. This this window of time where we could build as much as possible th- this uh, habit into uh, our routine, so that they do the cha- the channeling very well in their mind. So they would they would not make a mistake. Like when I talk to you, I wouldn't flip you know uh, french words in or, yes. or japanese words because yes. i know i associate you with the, with the english language yes. yeah. um so that that's what we build uh, really from day one uh with our kids now as the kids get a bit older they're going to realize that uh japanese and mandarin are very much minority sports in uh, morio mm-hmm. Uh, do you yes. think a situation might arise where they are uh, uh, embarrassed? Okay, you have the other languages yeah. in the picture. If we just focus on those two, um, mm-hmm. I know from my experience, my family background is partly Welsh. And Welsh yep. historically has been a low status language in Wales. The elite spoke English. Yeah. And so some children, particularly when they become teenagers, and I think this is a quite a common immigrant experience, they want yes. to integrate, or with minoritized languages, they want to integrate um, with uh, into the dominant and most prestigious language. And they may find the parental language, uh, particularly at an age when, let's face it, our parents are generally an embarrassment to us anyway. And they may rebel, <laughs> uh, rebel against yes. the language. And I, when I was learning Welsh, met some... Uh, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s who were going back to the language who said, oh, I wish I hadn't been such a such a, an awkward so-and-so when I, when I was 10. I just refused to speak Welsh to my parents. <clears throat> my parents just rolled mm-hmm. over being bilingual. Um, you haven't probably, probably had to face that. You may well not have to because not of yet. the younger other languages in play. But have people no, no. come to you with those prop, that problem? Have you seen friends with that so, problem? So, first of all, I've done that myself with my parents, uh-huh. so I know firsthand what that, how that feels. Um, but give, still, I've, I've emphasized, I've emphasized, uh, I've emphasized earlier that uh, that this window of time, you know, before they're seven, eight, uh, maybe maybe by ten. I, I think by ten, if I could really continue this scheme until they're ten, I've it's mission accomplished. Um, and, and the reason I say that is for us, what's most important is the hearing. Um, so kids, when they're born, uh, our theory is that kids, if you learn languages very, very young, uh, that's the age where their ears, you know, th- their auditory capacities are uh, fully open to all the uh, sounds that are create that, that are produced over the sound spectrum that that the, the that the human ear can uh, can hear, so that's the time to really give them all the language exposure to different languages. And if and different languages occupy different zones on the auditory spectrum, uh, so the wider the 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 uh, on the spectrum, if you can cover a wider range, then I, I, we think you know the chances of the kids being able to hear uh, the the nuances in different languages are better. Uh, so this capacity, if if you only learn one language as uh, as a child and you grow up, um, we think that your hearing will probably be very used to that little zone, whereas the other parts become, uh, well, I guess less developed uh so that's what we want to try to avoid and if you grow up you know up up to maybe 10 years old if you've heard english uh which is on a higher zone on the spectrum or uh, if you also speak japanese which is on a very lower lower end then uh you can cover a wider range and your ears will be used to that uh, for the rest of your life probably 
uh, that, that's sort of our theory. So, so re it's really those first 10 years uh, where you want to train your ears well uh, to uh, accepting different sounds and really being able to hear everything well. Now, if you can hear well and decipher the different sounds, your chances of being able to understand a language would be higher, even if you don't, you know, if you're learning for a new time, uh, the first time. If you can understand better, then obviously your chances of retaining will be better. If your chances of retaining are better, your chances of output will be better. That, so that's the cycle that we, we, we want to emphasize. So if they start rebelling, which we hope will be maybe when they're 13 or 14, uh, to us, it's kind of too late. <laughs> well, it's too late for them. The, the ears are already trained. Uh, if there's a period in, uh, in their lives where they just hate languages, so be it. It's okay. If they pick it up again when they're 18, it's fine. Their ears will be ready to receive new uh, input at that time. That, that's, that's sort of how we take it. So, um, so the key is then sort of developing the uh, phonological skills almost uh, early. And that is one of the things, isn't it, that, uh, you know, there's this critical period hypothesis that uh, yes. there's a certain cutoff point. Uh, that is generally, I think, uh, is not something that I subscribe to from what I've read. Mm -hmm. But the one area where it is generally, I think, thought that uh, kids do have an advantage is with pronunciation mm -hmm. and the yeah. auditory skills, as you say. So what you're saying there makes sense to me as an adult learner mm -hmm. i also like to put a lot of emphasis on trying to tr retrain my ear as i start a language and start with mm -hmm. a lot of auditory input too but of course yeah. as you say it's a different thing if you're there's a lot more spade work to do and it's always going to be much more difficult uh to get up mm -hmm. to the the very uh you know highest levels of sounding native uh if you haven't had it as a child yeah, well, I, I think the advantage of the child uh, in terms of accent, like you say, I, I, I think it's undeniable. And I'm not a, uh, personally, I'm not very academically, uh, I guess, trained in terms of languages. So I don't really know what all the back, all the background information of what hippo, uh, the, 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 the critical, uh, period, critical yes. the critical period hypothesis. I've had, you know, discussions with uh, uh, Tim Keeley about this and all, and if you say an adult and a child, uh, if you compare them side to side, side by side, then the adult has a higher uh, intellectual capacity to learn a language. I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say that's false or or true or false. I, I don't know. I I would intend, you know, I would be inclined to say the adult probably has a be better understanding. Uh, so if you give them the same number of hours of exposure to certain languages, the adult could probably pick it up faster than a child that i you know i wouldn't say that's false or anything uh but the reality is uh we see that kids learn more uh, it's just an observation the mechanics behind it there are different reasons uh and uh, all that is uh you know i i think valid so uh as an adult i think if you have motivation if you have drive and if you have hard work you can definitely do it um you know for sure no, however I the debate will continue. You speak from first-hand experience. Um, before we mm -hmm. move to the other languages then, uh, I was just wondering about reinforcing the Japanese and the Mandarin. Uh, do grandparents okay. and relatives uh, in Taiwan and Japan play a role here or relatives in, uh, in well, Montreal for that reason? Okay, well, it's a very good point. My father and my mother, so my father's Taiwanese and my mother's Japanese, they live under the same roof with us. So uh -huh. the kids have Mandarin from me and my father. Uh, and then they have Japanese from my wife and my mother. Uh, so that is fixed. Okay. And then uh, we are in Japan right now, specifically. Uh, I mentioned to you in another interview that I'm in Japan, not uh, specifically before work. I Work does follow me around, but I'm not here for work. It's really for my children. Um, we're going to be here for for uh, a few weeks. And they're going to stay. They are staying with their gra grandparents uh, on my, my my wife's side and uh, immersed in Japanese, going to a Japanese daycare or kindergarten, uh, and and just 
really strengthening uh, that minority language uh, for a given period of time. And then at the end of this month, we're going to go to Taiwan. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to put them in the, into a, uh, a Taiwanese school, uh, and they'll be m immersed in Mandarin 24-7. And that'll strengthen their, their Mandarin for uh, two, two and a half months uh, before I go back to, to Canada uh, in August. Is it almost a surprise for them to realize for the children, hey, it's not just uh, dad and granddad who speak this language or uh, my mum and her parents, but uh, actually there are all sorts of people, even other kids who speak this language. Well, my son, is, he's almost six now, and I think he's slowly beginning to realize things that are happening. Uh, they, he, he now knows... You know, he now he now knows that hey, his friends in Quebec don't speak Japanese or, or Mandarin. And then he comes to comes to Japan, and everybody speaks Japanese, and nobody speaks English. Uh, he's starting to understand these concepts, uh, but only starting. And he's already you know almost six. Uh, so so the, his language development is very advanced uh, before you know he even realizes much of the the, the theory and the, the actual things happening around him. Uh, were you worried that the children might mix up the languages as they were starting, particularly uh, mm. when they're very small? Mm. Not at all. I I wasn't worried that they would mix it up. I knew they would they would mix it up for a very short time. Uh, I did it myself when I was young. Uh, this is called code switching. So kids would, you know, before they really have to know the concept of language, all they have are words in, in different languages. They have vocabulary that they line up uh, in a sequence to try to convey what they want to say. So they would mix them up, and, and sometimes they would use three languages in one sentence, uh, switching around in, without ever realizing that that's what they were doing. But uh, that that clears up within one year, uh, and I knew that was going to happen. So I was not worried at all. My my kids, they all, they've all done that. Uh, and now they don't do it. Uh, they all um, channel right, with, very well. What sort of age? Was it the same age for all of them when that starts to clear up? So my my son did that around uh, two. Well, when you first start talking, I think I think it was around between two and three. Uh, that was there was there were a few months in there where he would just mix everything up. Um, do you think that look at him, looking at him now as a six year old? Uh, his uh, level in uh, it, has it slowed down having several languages his progress in each of the languages is he at a lower level in these languages than a monolingual child might be um, his strongest language tends to change a, depending on where we are but I I don't I don't think so uh, because uh, he can integrate into you know the social circles uh, in Quebec. Right here, he goes to school, and he's you know he's with the gang right away. Uh, and I know that's going to happen. It happened last year when we were in Taiwan, and I know it's going to uh, do the same thing again this year. So, what if if he is able to communicate with his peers uh, fully? Then I don't I don't see that you know as a problem uh, in any of the languages that he speaks. Um, uh, yeah, because I suppose that might be a, a concern that some parents might have when they're taking the decision initially to mm -hmm. raise children bilingually or not. Well, if you test them on a language by language, uh, you know, per, per language basis, uh, maybe his uh, maybe his Mandarin would be a little weaker right now. Uh, I know two months in, in Taiwan, it's going to get right up to par. Yeah. So there will be. Periods, if you don't work on it as hard as you know the other languages, that it will fall behind. Uh, but none of that is very important uh, to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, the most important for me is training the ears so that he will uh, re he will gain this capacity to learn any language he wants later in life to a very high level. Um, and so that 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 is the most important thing. Other than that, whether it's grammar or you know vocabulary and all that, we don't do any you know really academic stuff in our at our home, like like drills uh, and whatnot. Um, we we tend to let them just play and, and through different activities, 
get them to communicate with with their peers uh, and and strengthen their languages uh, that in that fashion. So um, so I can't say that if you learn three or five languages that there will be languages that will be uh, weaker than than others. Uh, well, most likely there will be. Uh, most likely some languages will be stronger than the than others. But uh, it's just not a, a big concern at all for for our family. Now, when when the kids get older, you're going to have to take decisions about whether they're going to become literate in Japanese and Chinese. Presumably, they're going to have the English and French from the school system. So mm -hmm. that is a big effort in any language to. Well, become I literate. love your questions. <laughs> I, I love your question. So wow. what's going to happen? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Uh, definitely the choice is theirs, okay? Uh, but we are preparing uh, for that uh, kind of indirectly. Well, living in Japan for, for a period of time, living in Taiwan for a period of time, they will be exposed to uh, the, the writing system and whatnot. Um, to really know the grammar and all the, the, the mechanics of a language, I, for us, it's not so important. I grew up in Taiwan, but I didn't go to a, a Chinese school, so I don't know how to write. Um, and by, by writing, I mean with my hands. I can't take a pen and write uh, many Chinese characters other than, other than my name or very simple stuff. Uh, but I can read. Yeah. I've never studied Chinese, but I can read. Why, uh, for some reason, I can read. And it's, I think it's all because of the, the, the TVs, <laughs> all the programs that I was watching in, in, in Taiwan, everything's, you know, they have the subtitles, you know, it's speaking Chinese and it's written in Chinese and you watch it and you just naturally pick it up. Uh, and I can read Japanese also because of all the, the mangas I read uh, and it's, it just somehow happened. Uh, I, I used to love like remote controlled cars. So my parents would buy these models, you know, car models for me, and I would have to read through the instruction manual uh, and build them. So, so all that to say is uh, just give them the environment, give them a motivation. It's what happened to me. I, I, just, I had to do it and I wanted to do it. So I, I did it. So I've never been educated neither in, in Japanese nor uh, Mandarin from, a, from an academic perspective, but I can read and, and um, I came to live in Japan uh, in uh, 2003 after my, my studies, um, and I was able to work in Japan for 11 years uh, in Japanese companies, working fully in Japanese, uh, reading, writing uh, in Japanese, obviously writing as in typing. So I had to improve a lot, but, but the base was there, foundation was there, uh, and, and uh, it was not a big problem. So you'd be hoping to give them at least that foundation to then do yes, with it what they want to if they if they do. Absolutely, they will have a very very good head start. Uh, you know, by the time they're eighteen, twenty, they want to live in Japan. Uh, they can already speak it fluently. Then it's it's not a big deal. If they want to learn how to write really with their hands, I mean, by all means, they can they can do it. Uh, they will have their head start. But already reading, I think they'll be able to do much. Quite a lot of it by then, uh, just just by you know, being exposed to a lot of the TVs and the, the mangas and and uh, and whatnot. So you have books in the different languages lying around, for example, and uh, yes, we do cartoons and so on. And, yeah. yeah, yes, we do. Well, I mean, uh, cartoons as in you know, YouTube and and the, the books. We, we we you know every year we come here, we would buy books, bring them back. Uh, so all, all we we have English books, Spanish books, you know, Japanese, Mandarin, uh, and and French. So these five languages, uh, uh, they're all there. And sometimes they would pick one up and, and just go read this to me. And then we have to find the person who's assigned to that language to read. I was that. going to say, let's open this up then and look a bit about at the French, English, and Spanish because uh, you said you're speaking Mandarin at home. Your yes. father is and then the Japanese from your wife's side, uh, where yes. are they getting exposure to the other languages? Okay, so so my son was three when our whole family, when we were living in uh, Asia at the time, we went back to uh, Quebec. So he was three, and, and that's when we decided, well, we're living in Canada, obviously we need to add French, well, we're living in Quebec. So going to a daycare solves that problem in Quebec, 
you know, especially where we live, all the daycares are in are in French, unilingual. Uh, and then, uh, given that I've learned Spanish myself, and I know that it's a very important language, uh, at least from a economic perspective, I guess, uh, later in life, it could be pretty useful if we continue to live in, in North America. So I wanted them to learn Spanish. Now, how we went about doing that was we decided we'll have, uh, we'll invite au pairs uh, from Mexico. And, uh, you know, through a lot of discussion with the family, uh, we decided that that was the strategy to go. And when we went back, you know, before going back, we contacted somebody and, and uh, when we got back, we hired her and, and it just, it worked out so well. <laughs> Uh, the, the the results are just it's quite impressive to have an au pair at home uh, and just just speaking to them in Spanish the whole time. So, so um, you know, it, it sounds uh, an incredibly rich life. I'm very envious of these children. I have to say, <laughs> uh, <linguistically>. me too. <laughs> Although I suppose they might end up taking it for granted. Um, but oh. that won't uh, detract from the wonderful gift that you're giving them. Well, you know, I, I can't thank my parents enough for for the the cultural and the linguistic uh, background that they've given me. So I'm just paying it forward. Uh, and uh, I, I think they will understand. <laughs> I hope they will. But, it, you know, whenever they do, uh, all I ask is that they pay it forward to, to their kids uh, and, and spread it around. Well, in 20 years' time, if uh, YouTube's still going and I'm still going, uh, maybe <laughs> I'll be able to ask them themselves um, what they're doing, <laughs> what they're doing with the language. Um, thanks very much, Tetsu, for taking this time to share your experiences. Now, um, this is an area where I imagine many parents or uh, potential parents watching would have a host of questions. Do you still have your website? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, so you're asking Tetsu. So my website is asktetsu.com. A-S-K-T-E-T-S-U. All right. And all my social media, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, it's all under at uh, Ask Tetsu. So if you just Google Ask Tetsu, you'll, you'll find one of my channels. And the last time I looked at the site, uh, people, you're able to, you know, submit questions for free, actually, to you for, for uh, advice. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I, I want to, you know get something going, uh, see if I can build a community. Yes. So so I, I, I want to know from you guys, you know, the, the, the audience really, what is the, you know, your burning questions and, and get myself familiarized and really, because I know how I did it. I know how, you know, I was raised, how I am raising my kids, but I want to know, uh, I guess, uh, different perspectives from, from all the parents out there. So so right now that that's what I think, I, you know, I want to do, I want to build, build my own knowledge base based on everybody's experience and there's a book as well i think yes i have a book that i wrote uh before uh, i had children uh it's called pampers to polyglot and it's really about uh, i've i've not tried to make a story out of what you know i live but i tried to synthesize it into seven ideas uh, based on how I was raised and how I thought I would raise my kids. So uh, that book is called Pampers to Polyglot, Seven Ideas uh, to Raise Multilinguals Like Me. And uh, it's so on we Amazon. Can, yeah. We can get that on Amazon. Okay, I'll, I'll link folks underneath to, to the website and, and give more details about the book. And has the theory in the book, uh, has, has it stood, uh, stood up to reality then uh, when you've got three kids running around? Running around? Uh, absolutely. Um, in the book, I don't develop on one person, one language, but I do talk a little bit about au pairs. Yep. And at that time, obviously, it was just theory, uh, but it's, it's worked out so well. And, uh, um, and, and, and although I don't explicitly talk about one person, one language, uh, I just realized that everything does revolve around that. And it's really become our religion. One, one person, one language uh, really solved a lot of the the logistics issues, uh, I think, in the way we teach our children, make give them the, the environment to, to use different languages. So, so that I think if I were to, to update uh, my book or actually write a next book, uh, that you know, one person, one language will be somewhere in, in as a 
as an explicit topic, and then I'll, I'll develop more on on how we did it over the past uh, five six years with uh, with our kids, with real examples, uh, with the kids now. Great. Okay. Well, it sounds like you know the message is consistency. Um, it's yeah. don't be afraid. It will work out. Um, the kids may mix things up a bit, but it all works out. And also, of course, taking conscious decisions to, and this links back to the consistency, build the languages into the into your lives and the lives of your children. The, en the environment. Yeah, I, I, I like to call it context. It's, it's your living context, really. So, yeah. so yeah, we've not developed too much too much on the uh, different elements that I think even adult learners could use. You know, things like. Uh, for example, if you if you have a one hour commute, you would listen to things in your target language. That kind of stuff we apply it to our kids. It's yes. really about building a context. I even made an acronym, CLAP, C L A P. So I call it contextual language acquisition philosophy. It's really a philosophy on how to make everything um, build languages into your life, or which we we've, we've done with uh, au pairs is to actually build the context you know, uh, to, to to make the kids have a different context that, you know, that's artificially made uh, that that gives them that exposure. So either way it works. Everything is about context. And um, I suppose I have to ask you, what language, just to finish, what language do you speak with your wife when they're just the two of you at home? Ah, uh, that's opening another can of worms, maybe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, I speak, I speak um, Japanese with, with my wife, uh, yes. that's for sure. And uh, I think the, the underlying question uh, I think behind that is then the kids know you speak other languages. Will they, you know, will will they pick another language later in life? Uh, and I, and my answer to that is no. Uh, and I think I've, I, you know, I want to re reiterate the importance of of routine and consistency and and habit. Uh, when you build a habit and you speak a certain language with somebody, somewhere along the way it becomes weird to speak a different language. And that's what you want to build with your children. Yeah. You want to make sure that they speak just one language with you. And regardless of what happens, this has become weird. Even if they know that you speak English better than Mandarin, uh, they've been so accustomed to speaking Mandarin with you that they have to speak that. Otherwise, it's just weird. I, I'm sure you have an ex that kind of experience with other people uh, where you, for whatever reason, you started to speak each other's second language. but just sort of got accustomed to that and, and you just continue doing that so that, that's the habit that i think we we build in and uh, and it's working well and an awful lot of fun and joy as well on the way seeing the children uh, exploring this uh uh rich yeah. linguistic landscape um, yes yeah tetsu thank you very much for taking the time to go into such detail i think that's incredibly valuable for people uh, as I say, if you'd like to find out more, uh, check the links under this video. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done already. Uh, share the video, that would be great, or hit the like button uh, if you found it useful and you think that others might. Um, Tetsu, once again, thank you very much for sharing this with us. And the best thank of you luck. for hearing me uh, out. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye now.